we're recording. All right, I think I did it right this time. We're talking about our Monday night uh, Bible study time and uh, questions and answers and chasing rabbits. Uh, I know last week uh, we did one, uh, I went to Philippians uh, 4, I think it was, and answered the question about uh, uh, how, how to deal with worry. And I, when I got through, I thought to myself, boy, I should have saved that one for a Sunday morning. <laughs> and, so, uh, and I nearly came and preached it this morning for those who weren't here, but then I knew that there'd be a whole lot who were here, and I didn't want to do it so quickly. So maybe in a month or two, I'll come back and get that, and that'll be beneficial to all that's here Sunday morning. But then uh, Marilyn sent me a note about uh, last times, or the end times, and she had a question about that. And so I thought, well, that'd be a good Monday night question to answer, but it might be also good for Sunday morning. And I don't want to do it on Monday night and then turn around and wish I had done it on Sunday morning. And so, and so we're going to do that this morning. If you will, turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy and then 2 Timothy. Of course, they're right there back to back. But 1 Timothy, we're going to read 1 Timothy chapter 4. And then we're going to go uh, into 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we might bounce around a couple of other places. But uh, that's where we're going to get our, our start as we study that question. What about the last times, or what about the end times? And so let me preface kind of by way of introduction, first and foremost is, when we think about last times or end times, uh, then most of the time, because of uh, because of our church upbringing, or because of what we've been exposed to, and and uh, wherever we've gone to church, and uh, you know, in the past, uh, normally when we think about the last times or the end times, we're thinking about Israel's last times and Israel's end times. And so we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew twenty-four, Mark thirteen, some of those other places that talk about the coming tribulation and the 70th week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble. And so through the Old Testament, when you read prophecy about the last times or the end times, that prophecy is not talking about the last time or the end times of the church, the body of Christ. That prophecy, if you're again in Genesis through Malachi, and it's talking about prophecy about the end times or the last times, it has to do with prophecy and the end times and last times of Israel. If you're in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus is teaching, uh, their, or the apostles or disciples or someone's asking questions, or Jesus is teaching and answering those questions about the end times or the last times, again, uh, those are the last times and the end times of the nation of Israel as God deals with Israel according to prophecy. And then as we teach rightly dividing the word of truth and our Bible being divided up into three parts, times past, Genesis through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even basically through Acts, and then but now, uh, the letters written by our Apostle Paul, Romans through Philemon, and then the ages to come, and that's at the end of our Bible, so we have Hebrews through Revelation. And I always encourage folks to read Hebrews through Revelation in light of and study those books, of what are called the Jewish epistles, and they're called that for a reason, and they're at the end of our Bible for a reason, so when you read Hebrews through Revelation or study those books, do so in light of uh, the end times of the people of Israel. And so... Again, if you're in Hebrews through Revelation and it's talking about end times or talking about the coming of Christ or the appearing of Christ, it is always in reference to prophecy as it relates to the people of Israel and God's dealings with the nation of Israel. And so when I teach about end times or last times, uh, and, and, and my habit is... Uh, I, I will take you and show you all those prophecies and all that scripture about the end times of Israel so that I could then put it in contrast to our end times. But when I do that, uh, it takes sometimes weeks to do that, and so I'm trying to avoid getting tied up in any multi-week messages if I can. And so let me just say it like that then, what I've said about Israel's end times and where you find those. 
So if we want to find out about the end times of the church, the end times of the body of Christ, those latter times right before or, or anything that might give us some indication uh, about when are we going to be raptured out? When are we going to be caught up together with the Lord in the air? And so shall we ever be with the Lord. When is all that going to take place? And are there any, is there anything that we can look at? Is there any instruction from our apostle regarding our last times? And so I think that you'll find that there is as we look at these passages. This is again one of those, those issues, one of those conversations, one of those doctrines that is so very important that we do understand how to rightly divide the word of truth. All the Bible is for us. It's all for our learning. I can go in there and learn about Israel's last times according to prophecy. It's all for our learning. I can learn about Israel's last times according to prophecy and then contrast that with our last times. But again, it's important to rightly divide the word of truth. Don't go in there and get yourself all upset when you read about their end times and think that that's what's happening today. Because we're under this time called the mystery. We're not under and dealing with that thing called prophecy. And so, when you see uh, wars and rumors of wars, when you see earthquakes, when you see, uh, uh, you know, hurricanes, they got a hurricane headed into Florida's south uh, west coast, I think, uh, they're firing down on. Uh, coming in a few days, I guess. Uh, when you see all that kind of stuff, all the trouble going on in this world, uh, that is not the signs of our end times. And what we see, uh, I mean, let's think about it. Our entire lives, we have seen wars, we have seen hurricanes, we've seen <laughs> storms, we've seen fires, we've seen floods, we've seen all that stuff. But to the degree it's going to be in Israel's end times is, is going to be a much, much greater degree than what we're seeing in, in our life. And so don't be bothered about those things and don't think that the end times are upon us because of all the stuff we've seen happen in the climate and so on and so forth. All right. So enough of that. Uh, we want to see about our end times. So we're going to start in 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to read through there and make a few comments, and then we're going to 2 Timothy chapter 3. So when we think about Israel's last times, it's always earthly phenomena. Something going on uh, around the earth or on the earth with people as far as wars and so on, or, or, or uh, uh, weather events or something like that. But let's look at what Paul tells us. And he writes 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and I always encourage us to read this as Paul it gives the instructions to 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. These are the last books toward the last books that Paul wrote. I think he wrote 1 Timothy, Ephesians, and then 2 Timothy right there toward the end of his ministry. And so as he writes this, not only is he writing it then to Timothy, then by extension, it, it we can gather for ourselves, okay, here's what we're to be looking for. Here's the evidence that we're going to see. So he says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Now the Spirit, that the capital S, so that's the Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith, and of good doctrine, Whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, 
in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now when Paul begins this letter, he's writing this in chapter 4. Uh, he says, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. And he goes on and begins to describe this departure from the faith. And so let me point out first and foremost, and we're going to see this as we read here and as we go over to 2 Timothy, uh, right up front, what does Paul tell us that the evidence of the latter times, as he says there in verse 1, what is the first thing we're to notice about the latter times of the dispensation of the grace of God? What's the issue? Is the issue hurricanes? Is the issue earthquakes? Is the issue uh, uh, floods and fires? Uh, is the issue wars? No. So when you see all that stuff, that's not the stuff that should alarm you. Again, when God dealt with Israel, Israel was an earthly people with earthly promises and an earthly inheritance. We are a heavenly people with heavenly promises, promises and a heavenly inheritance. And so we don't, we're, we don't, what does Paul say? We walk by faith, not by sight. We, uh, we talk about, we uh, try to find the right thing coming to my mind. Uh, Though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And so when, when we talk about our relationship with the Lord and what God's doing in our lives and, and in the members of the church, the body of Christ, excuse me, the body of Christ, we're talking about that inward work, that spiritual work that he's doing in the hearts and lives of those that are saved. And so the warning here is he talks about the latter times. He says, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And then he goes on and talks about that. And of course, he gets down here and he talks about uh, verse 7, refuse profane and old wives' fables. And exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And he comes down here and he says, uh, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. There, verse 16. Uh, he says, verse 13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Alright, so all, already we've learned something that will begin to answer that question for us. How is it that we are to determine or understand or, or, or to see uh, evidence that uh, the catching away of the church, the body of Christ, uh, could be right upon us, the latter times of this dispensation of the grace of God? And it has to do not with events as far as things that go on in the climate or that kind of thing in the world, but it has to do with doctrine, excuse me, doctrine, and what people are doing with doctrine and whether or not they're staying true to the Word of God or whether they're parting from the truth of the Word of God. Everybody see that? It's about a spiritual thing that's going on. What are people doing with the gospel? What are people doing with the Word of God? That's the real sign of uh, whether or not we're coming into the latter days. Now, as we think about that, I think it's pretty easy for us to see as we think about churchianity, uh, I mean, all, you know, y'all give testimony, you come out of denominational churches, and many times you've said, you know, we've been in church our whole lives, and we have learned very little Bible doctrine. We don't know very much Bible doctrine. We know the Bible stories, we know uh, about Adam and Eve in the garden, and we know about Cain and Abel, and we know about Joshua, and we know about uh, uh, Samson and Delilah, and we know about David and the giant, and you know, we know all these Bible stories and they've been devotionalized and, and we know about the letters in red and, and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to why do I believe what I believe, we find ourselves short when it, give, it comes to giving Bible answers. Most of the time, what we believe is just what we've been taught in whatever particular church we've gone to. 
And, and if somebody asks us a question, why do you believe that particular doctrine? Most of us are going to scratch our head and say, well, that's just the kind of church I go to. That's what my preachers always taught me. That's what my granddaddy believed. That's what my mama believed. And so they taught me that. And if it was good enough for my granddaddy and it was good enough for my mama, bless God, it's good enough for me. Well, you know what? You say that in traditional church and you know what you get? Hey, man, glory to God. Hallelujah. Preach it, brother. Give me that old time religion. But then we sit down and we say, okay, you believe in the eternal security of the believer. Take me to one passage of scripture and show me that. And people are backing up saying, well, 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 I know it's in there somewhere. And so, you know, whatever doctrine we want to talk about. And so when he says there in verse 1 of, of 1 Timothy chapter 4, uh, let me read it correctly. Get in the right place, Sam. Where he says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing of spirits, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and he tells us, verse 7, Refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. A whole lot of what we've been taught, a whole lot of what we say we believe, we find out when we really get into the Word of God is just tradition. And, and when it comes right down to us, it's, it's doctrines of devils. And it's fables and old wives tales. It's just something that's been passed on from one generation to other without any real foundation in Scripture. Well, there's the warning and there's the evidence of the latter times. Makes us think we might be living in the latter times. Go with me now to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's begin to read and study through here just a little bit. Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, This know also that in the last days... So, what's Paul telling us about? The last days. Is Paul going to tell us about the last days of Israel? No. Did he tell us in 1 Timothy about the latter times of Israel? No. He's talking to us about the latter times or the last days of the church, the body of Christ, this dispensation of the grace of God. So he says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. When we watch the news or we look what's going on in the world, do we think we live in perilous times? Sure we do. But let me tell you that what ought to make us even more concerned and, and give us more evidence about perilous times is when we turn on Christian radio or we turn on t Christian TV broadcast or we go to the typical local assembly or the typical local church and we listen to what's being preached and we listen to what's being taught. Uh, that's what really tells us we live in the we live in the last days and in perilous times. He goes on and says, "For men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors." heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now stop right there before you read the next verse. Well, that sounds like all the heathen out there around us, doesn't it? I mean, that's what that sounds like. But yet notice what the next verse says. Paul says, having a form of godliness, but, deny, but denying the power thereof from such term away. And so as we keep reading through here, we're going to find out that this definition of verses 2, 3, and 4 about perilous times and how people are going to be, this is a whole lot to do with church folks. And again, think about what we see going on out there in churchianity. And uh, the evidence is very, very real, very true. All right, now, verse, uh, verse 6, continue on. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly, captive, silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. I'm going to go ahead and read through the end of the chapter and then come back up and pick up and walk through. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 8. Now as James and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. 
men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no farther, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will love godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And so as we read down through there, of course he tells us what the last days are going to look like. He, going to, he tells us the things that are going to be going on in the last days. And again, it all has to do with Bible truth and sound Bible doctrine. And then he finishes the chapter up telling us that we get our answers from the scriptures. Because that's inspired and that's profitable and that's what we use to, to get the information that we need from the scriptures. But let's walk down through this for here just a minute. Verse 5, he says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Turn back to your right here, Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Talk about this having a form of godliness. Verse 16 of Titus chapter 1. He says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate, or below standard, or outside of the acceptable, the acceptance of God. So, but notice again, verse 16 at the beginning of Titus 1, at the very first few words, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Well, the work says they relate to the truth of the Word of God. So he comes back here, verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Now, let's see if we can recall. If we use the word, if you hear me use the word power, what's the reference I'm usually going to take you back to when we talk about the word power? Does that come to anybody's mind? How about Romans 1.16? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So, so when we get to 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5 talking about these last days, talking about these perilous times, talking about how these folks are described in verses 2, 3, and 4, he says in verse 5 they have a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Think about conversations you get into with folks just about the gospel. And I'm, talk, I'm talking about lost folks. I'm not talking about unchurched folks. When you sit down and have a conversation with the average church-going folk in the community or in your family and so on and so forth, when you present to them the truth of the gospel that salvation is by grace through faith and the finished work of Christ, plus nothing and minus nothing, do you often get an argument? It can't be that easy. You mean to tell me I don't have to do anything except trust Christ and He saves me? That's the gospel. You mean I don't have to walk an aisle and pray a prayer and cry tears and try to remember and confess all my sins? No. You just believe that Christ did it all and you're trusting Him. You mean I don't have to join the church and start giving money? No. You mean I don't have to stop doing the things I'm not supposed to do and start doing the things that I am supposed to do? No. No. Not when it comes to your salvation. Salvation is simply a gift from God that's freely given by grace through faith. We hear the gospel that Christ died for our sins. 
But he didn't stay dead. He was buried and was risen again the third day for our justification. And the gospel is made very clear to us that it's freely given to us by the grace of God. And all we have to do is receive the free gift. But yet when we sit down and talk to folks in these last days, in these latter times, there's a whole lot of doctrines of devils. Remember the God of this world has blinded the eyes of them which believe not. So if we have church folks, religious folks, good, well-intentioned folks, but they don't understand that the gospel is simply simple faith in the finished work of Christ alone, and they're teaching others that they've got to do something else besides simply trust Christ, where did that doctrine come from? Came from the devil. Is, does the devil have any problem with you reading the Bible? Does the devil have any problem with you talking about Jesus? No, the devil's got a problem with you giving the pure gospel of the grace of God because it's the gospel of Christ, the gospel of the grace of God that Romans 1.16 tells us is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that does what? Believes it. How many times have I said it like this? This is kind of a test for each person. If it's something you can use as you share your testimony, as you seek to share your faith with others, you can ask this question of them. And you can say it like this. Answer the question. Fill in the blank. I know I'm going to heaven because. And then listen to what they say. I know I'm going to heaven because my mom and daddy told me that when I was eight years old, I went to vacation Bible school and I came home and I said I was saved. I know I'm going to heaven because I did some religious act, had some religious experience. I know I'm going to heaven because, and, and this is one of the things probably that bothers me as much as anything, I know I'm going to heaven because I remember the day I was baptized. And folks, if you're looking back on your water baptism to mark your salvation, that's not the answer. And so once again, as we think about the last days, the latter times of the church, the body of Christ, it's verse 5, having the form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. In other words, don't get involved in those doctrines of devils, those, fab those fables. Verse 6, he says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lust. Now men can read that. We say, that's right. Those silly women. The women read that, and they come back, and how many times have we heard church folks say this? I don't like Paul because he didn't like women. Anybody ever heard that? I've heard that. Well, I don't like Paul because he didn't like women. Well, that's not the truth. Well, what about this verse you just read? Well, let's think about this verse that I just read. For of this sort are they which creep, which creep into houses. Now, you know, I'm one of these word chasers. So as I was studying, preparing, I looked up the word creep. You ever met a creep? <laughs> Do you know every other place that the word creep is used in our Bible? It, it talks about creep or creeping things. Creeping beasts and creeping creatures. Think about that cockroach crawling around. Creeping things. Think about that mouse or that rat creeping, moving around. Creeping things. Think about that... Uh, Coyote creeping around. I mean, think about creeping things and creep. Every other place the, the word creep is used, it's used in that kind of context. And so he says, For this sort are they which creep into houses. Do you think it might be said that Satan, that old serpent, crept into the Garden of Eden? In Genesis chapter 3, when he saw Eve, 
So it says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. Let's look at a couple of references and see where this takes us. Look back at Titus. Again, Titus chapter 1. Look at Titus chapter 1 verse 10. I think that's where I want to go. Yeah, Titus chapter 1 verse 10 and 11. Paul says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Do we see that going on all the time? Teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake? What's filthy lucre? Filthy money. Now listen, is money evil of itself? No. But the Bible tells us the love of money is the root of all evil. And so when folks are teaching things which they ought not, contrary to sound doctrine and they're doing it because it gives them a paycheck then that makes the lucre filthy lucre and notice what it says about it verse 11 they subvert whole houses again chapter, or chapter 2 Timothy 3 verse 6 talks about uh, they creep into houses uh, look with me at uh, chapter 3 of Titus. Look at verse 9. Chapter 3 of Titus. Verse 9. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and scribings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted. Back to that subverting whole houses are subver is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. Now go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2 there across the page. He says in verse 14. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Words to no profit. In other words, these, these strivings about these words to no profit. Well, what is it they're doing? The, strive, the words are to no profit. But what do the words do? They subvert the hearers. Now go with me all the way back to uh, Genesis chapter 3. And I want to show this illustration before I... Why does he say something about leaving creep into houses and leave captive silly women? Genesis chapter 3. He says again, I'm going to read 2 Timothy 3, 6 again. Then we're going to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Again, Paul says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. And we go back to Genesis chapter 3, drop in at verse 6. This is after the exchange between the serpent and Eve. It says, verse 6, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. First John chapter 2, verse 16 tells us that uh, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that is in the world is the lust, and he talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And when I look at verse 6 of Genesis 3, the woman saw that the tree was good for food, lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and a tree desired to make one of wise, the pride of life. And so we go back again to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and the reason we point this out is because as we're looking at that, when he says, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. Most of the time in a household, if it's a husband and wife, who's the first one to start going to church? <laughs> 
most of the time? The wife. And she stays on the husband and stays on the husband and stays on the husband until eventually one day he runs up a white flag and he says, okay, I'll go. Doesn't that seem to be the typical pattern? Way back there in the garden, did the serpent come, did the serpent come to Adam? No. Who'd he go to? Went to Eve. And by going to Eve, and as verse 6 of 2 Timothy 3 talks about, these captive silly women laid with sins, led away with divers lusts, did he not approach her with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? And then did she not succumb to that? And then she turned around and gave to Adam. Now I've long contended that Satan does what works. How does he get to the men? Through the women. Isn't that true? The Satan gets to the men through the women. And so when he says there, for this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, I think it takes us all the way back to the garden and the pattern, and this is what worked, and it still works. Well, what's that mean, Brother Sam? Put that in the shoe leather for us. That means a, a lady, is, it makes she's searching for the Lord, she, she has interest in the things of God, and she shows up at some church because somebody maybe she works with or a family member or somebody invited her and she goes and she gets in that church and she gets involved and that church isn't preaching the gospel. That church isn't preaching the truth of the word of God. That church is preaching old wives' fables. It's preaching doctrines of devils. It's preaching all kind of error. But she gets in there and she gets involved with that. And the next thing you know, she's getting her husband in there. And now the wife and the husband and they're all going and they're all getting involved. And they think they're doing good and they think they're headed for heaven. But if they've never trusted the simplicity of the gospel and the gospel has been perverted, they'd have been better off to stay at home. You understand? And so I think the idea for this sort of they which creep into houses and leave captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lust, I think that's a part of the tool. This is what Satan does to get in these old wives' fables, to get in these doctrines of devils. Now verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Think about the renowned preachers of the day. They all have a whole lot of initials behind their names, don't they? I could start calling names, but then I'd make somebody mad, wouldn't I? <laughs> but you think about the leading television preachers of the day, the leading radio preachers of the day, whatever denomination, whatever stripe. They're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And sometimes we get swayed because a preacher has a big ministry, a, a, a teacher has a big ministry, they write books, you go to the Christian bookstore and you find, you know, a dozen books written by this particular author or they have this great following and, and uh, they have this great quote unquote ministry and we think, well surely God's got to be in that. But we live in the last days and the latter times of the body of Christ, the dispensation of the grace of God. And we're warned that in those last days, in the, in, the, in the latter times of the church, the body of Christ, these folks out there in the religious world, they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You sit down with a pastor or a, a professional clergyman and you tell him just basic stuff. Salvation by grace through faith and finished work of Christ plus nothing minus nothing. You're going to get an argument. You tell him Paul is the apostle to the church, the body of Christ. Not Peter, not James, not John, but Paul is the apostle. The church, the body of Christ. You're going to get an argument. You say 
We're not instructed to live by the letters in red in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But we're instructed to live by the letters the ascended Lord Jesus Christ gave to the Apostle Paul and wrote in Romans through Philemon. You're going to get an argument. And how many times have I been in a discussion with someone and when they couldn't answer the question, they resorted to, well, I've been preaching for 50 years. And I've never heard that, never taught that. Well, you know, if I want to continue a discussion with them, I may sidestep that. If I'm ready to end the discussion, I'm going to say, well, it's a god-awful shame that you've been in preaching for 50 years and you don't know any more than you know. <laughs> right? That would kind of end the conversation. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that would kind of end the conversation. And sometimes I've done that because I was ready to end the conversation. I found out I was wasting my time. And so he said, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Folks get tied up in the religious tradition and the denominationalism and what's been handed down to them through the tradition of whatever strike that they're parted up with and they, they can't learn the truth because they can't let go of the error. And folks, that's a sign of the last times and the, the last days and the latter times of the church, the body of Christ. He goes on and says, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Now James and Jambres, those were Pharaoh's magicians. Remember way back there in the story of Moses bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt? And Moses would cast, you know, he threw that rod down and that rod became a snake. He picked that rod up and it would become a rod again. He picked that stick up, that snake up and it become a rod again. Well, guess what Pharaoh's magicians did? Exact same thing. And all this kept going on until all of a sudden the people of Egypt were tied up in boils and even the magicians were tied up in boils, had sores and boils all over them. And, uh, the magicians couldn't make a face in front of Moses because they were all covered up in boils. They couldn't repeat that one. They couldn't do anything to fix it. But as Janus and Jambers withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Janus and Jambers were religious instructors under Pharaoh. But they, they were called magicians. And folks, there's a whole lot of magicians in pulpits this morning. Mm -hmm. Preaching doctrines of devils. He says, these men are men of, they resist the truth. They're men of corrupt minds. They're reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no farther, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Paul tells us in Romans 1, Romans 2.16 that there's coming a day when the secrets of men will be judged according to Paul's gospel. So there's coming a time where their folly will be made manifest. Verse 10, and he encourages Timothy now. He says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. And he says, verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Well, again, what does it mean to live godly in Christ Jesus? Does it mean to don't drink, smoke, cuss, or chew? That's not what it means. It means all which live godly in Christ Jesus. Well, what's the whole context? The whole context is sound doctrine. The whole context is knowing your Bible and getting sound Bible doctrine. The whole context is folks who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. The whole, co the whole context is folks who creep into houses and leave captive silly women laden away with divers' lusts. The whole context is about folks who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
The whole context are about folks who resist the truth, who have corrupt minds, who are reprobate concerning the faith. Who what they do is called folly in verse 9. And so what he says in verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you live godly, that means that if you are out sharing the truth of the gospel of Christ, salvation is by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ, plus nothing and minus nothing. And you're emphatic from the scriptures that you don't have to do anything or add anything to the simplicity of the gospel for someone to be saved. Are you going to suffer persecution for that? Yes, you are. Even, and, and not from lost folks, from the religious world. Again, I remind, where did Paul suffer his greatest persecution? Was it from the heathen? It was from the religious folks. Most of the trouble that Paul had, he had from the religious folks. Uh, even take it back, who crucified Jesus? The religious folks. So all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Does it say every believer is going to suffer persecution? That's not what it says, is it? It says all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So again, when you stand up and say Paul's the apostle... Salvation is by grace through faith and the finished work of Christ, plus nothing and minus nothing. You said, this King James Bible is the Word of God, perfect and inspired and preserved by God. You stand up for those things and you say, uh, our last days are not about storms and, and things that go on in the, uh, in the climate and so on. Our last days is about doctrine. If you start preaching and teaching good, sound Bible doctrine and good, sound truth, and you have those conversations with folks, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Verse 13, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, do we have, I mean, we got, we got a midterm election coming up, don't we? And boy, folk, folks are hopeful that this midterm election will change some things politically. It might. It might not. I'm not putting my hope in any midterm elections. Of course, depending on how much of a degree you want to go, do you know there's still folks that think something's going to happen tomorrow, the next day, next week? And the current administration is going to be thrown out. And Trump's going to be brought back in. There's folks who still believe that. I hear it all the time. Church going folks. We still got signs all around the neighborhood. Trump 2022. <laughs> and we're going to have flags going up soon. They're going to be saying. Trump 2024. And so in our, in our life, would we like for things to get better politically in our country? And we would all have our own opinion about how to bring that about. But are things going to get gooder and gooder or are things going to get worser and worser? Things are not going to get gooder and gooder. I mean, if Trump, if, if, if the current administration was thrown out and Trump was put in, verse 13 is still true. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. There is nothing going to happen that's going to make things get better. Things are not going to get better. They're going to get worse. As we continue on in these latter times, as we continue on in these last days, Things are going to get worse and worse. Why? Because evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 